Good evening. Uh, quite unknown to me when my uh, friend and colleague at work, Niruban, uh, had nominated me to speak at TEDx, uh, I was wondering what would be an idea worth sharing. And I thought, if I connect the dots, so to speak, in my life, and think of the most important moments, I quickly realized that it had very little to do with technology or the business that I've been involved in. You see, when I was 15 years old, I was introduced to Marxism by my brother Francis, who I see over there. Uh, he took me to see this veteran trade unionist called Bala Thampo. And Bala Thampo was an extraordinary man, and it was a life-changing moment for me. Because, you see, Bala was a, a, a great socialist in the true sense of the word. And uh, he was a humanist. He was a brilliant lawyer, probably one of the best his country has produced, and yet he chose not to amass wealth for himself, but dedicated his entire life for the upliftment of the working people of this country in particular, and also the other oppressed people. Now, it is my, through my relationship with Bala that I became socially conscious. But my Marxism in practice I learned from my mother, when I was about five years old. Now, my mother was 20 when she married my father, who was 40, a staunch Catholic, and he took to heart the, the biblical saying, go forth and multiply. <laughs> and, 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 and so he did. He, uh, in a period of 20 years, he gave my mother 11 children. And in a moment of absolute selfishness, he dropped dead when he was 64. <laughs> I was four. Don't make calculations, please. So, and, and, and my mother was left in an utterly hopeless situation. Uh, she had, uh, what Francis, we had like 15 people in the house, my grandmother, cousins, 15 people. And she has to sustain this family with a meager income of my father's pension. How did she do it? Uh, some years later, I asked her, now, weren't you terrified when this happened? And, and she said, no. And I said, why not? Because I knew that God will provide. Simple as that. Faith. But I think, it is an ingenuity that held and sustained this family. I remember an incident when, uh, soon after we had my father and dad, we moved to a new house, and uh, there was a neighbor, and for some strange reason that I can't remember, he took a disliking to us, and one night he said he was going to attack a house. My mother, being a good Catholic, got the children together, we all knelt down and prayed, and then she realized that prayer alone might not save the day, we better prepare. And so, uh, we organized ourselves, there was a front door barricaded, my brothers were in front with whatever they could lay their hands on. I remember a three-pong garden uh, fork and, uh, and, and, some, and a crowbar, deadly equipment. But behind were my sisters with pots of chili water. <laughs> chili powder dissolved in water and the game plan was if the intruders broke through, the boys will duck, the girls will throw the chili water and then we'd go at them with utmost ferocity. But, uh, but you see, uh, 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 nobody came, and, and it was all right. Uh, but you see, in this one instance is uh, when I realized the, the, the Marxist maxim, an ounce of action is worth a ton of theory. And, uh, and there were two important lessons for me, really. One is that the power of organizing, how to organize the limited resources with creativity and, 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 and innovation. And secondly, very importantly, any successful action can only start with a clear consciousness of the issues at hand. And in this case, it was a mother wanting to protect her family. But today, sadly, a lot of us are completely indifferent and, uh, and disengaged from, from any of the large issues that face the people of this country. Uh, we think that to be involved in any collective action is to be political. And oh my God, that's a bad word, isn't it? You go to a party and you talk about any of the large issues and people say, hey, please don't start a political discussion here. Are you no politics, please? And then we leave it to the politicians to address the issues that affect our lives and the lives of the people of this country. How foolish is that? Do you think that this archaic institution called our parliament can really bring about any meaningful change to our lives and for this country? And the people whom we elect, are they truly representative? of us and the interests of our community. And yet we show up at elections, hold the pencil in our hand and the ballot paper and think, my God, we are going to exercise a great democratic freedom for change. And then we get disappointed, like what you hear these days, huh? I say these fellows are just the same, no better than the other lot. And this goes on. 
But nothing has changed in this world without the participation of the masses of the people. Nothing. And yet we are afraid to get involved in any kind of collective action because we think that to be involved in action is a frightening prospect. You know, we equate with demonstration, tear gas, uh, broken limbs, death. But you know what? In my life, organizing was not such a daunting task, really. Because in 1976, when I was in the advanced level class, uh, for the first time in Sri Lanka, the police had entered the university in Peradeniya and shot dead a student. Now, this is the first time this had happened. And uh, so we quickly got together and we said, uh, do, should we do something about this? And then all my friends and some of us said, absolutely, we should. So on the day that the trade unions called for a day of action, mind you, this is one life in 1976. I don't want to talk about the thousands of deaths that we have had later, and we have been completely indifferent to this. One death, when the trade union stopped work, we boycotted classes. And no, mo no mobile phones, no Facebook, no nothing. There was a soccer match the previous day. We sent the word out. The next morning, I went to the canteen. I hid and looked at the, when the bell rang, the director came. No one, except a few stragglers who hadn't got the message, obviously. Uh, but, you know, so what did we achieve? A collective consciousness that even a killing of one student is completely deplorable. And then much later, and, and we had good fun doing these things. Much later, when I was at State Bank of India, my first job, I was 22, I was elected president of the, Ceylon, of the Bank Employees Union of the branch. There was some dispute, I can't remember what it was. We thought we'd keep our strike action as the action of last resort. And we said, can we do something creative? And you know what we did? We decided we were going to come to work in our sarongs, and the ladies will come in their house coats. <laughs> now, the ladies were wearing the house coats over what they were wearing. We didn't have much under our sarong. And, and, uh, uh, and this was not one of those fancy hand loom sarongs. Huh? These, are, these are cloth that you tie and, you know, just like, you know, you come out of your ablutions on a Sunday morning and, uh, and there we were. And, and you have no idea what this was unless you know I've been inside State Bank of India. It's a majestic building in Fort. Uh, massive columns, high ceilings, uh, fans with beautiful windows and this emblem of the old name of the old bank, Imperial Bank of India. And there we were running around. But our customers were served. But the bank's image was not. And very quickly they settled it, and we had great fun. Uh, but, and you might ask yourself, okay, fine, you had some success, but isn't this a very local issue? Can you really address the larger issues facing the people of this country by non-confrontational protest action? And I want to share with you probably the most important struggle that I have been a part of, and that was to save the phosphate deposit in Appawala. Now, Appawala, as you know, is a, uh, you may not know, uh, is, a, is a village 240 kilometers in the north central province of this country. Uh, in 1970, a, a, a substantial deposit of phosphate was found. Now, phosphate, as you know, is a non renewable natural resource. And the National Science Foundation at that time had said if we mine this sustainably, we can make it last 200 years. I've read some articles that said you can make it last a thousand years. Now, meanwhile, in other parts of the world, phosphate was depleting, and phosphate is very important for the production of uh, fertilizer. But the government of the day, 1990, decided to hand over these, these deposits to an international consortium that included a notorious uh, mining company called Freeport McMoran. And they were going to strip mine this and deplete this very rare resource in 30 years. And in the process, they would have devastated and destroyed one of the most agriculturally and archaeologically rich parts of this country, ravaged and ruined very much like what they did to an island called Nauru in the South Pacific, seven square kilometers, second richest in the world, per capita income, today destitute. And the island looks like a crater, cratered moon. Now one single man decided he must do something about it, a lonely monk, Mahamankada Pieratan Thera, from the ancient temple Purana Vihari of Galkanda, he decided, we can't let this happen. And he mobilized the people. Now that caught the attention of the trade union, led by Bala Thampu, whom I spoke about. He was terribly inspired by this man. And we went to Apawala and found the courage and determination with which these people were ready to even lay down their lives. And the monk was threatened. But the trade union got involved, the peasants in the, in, the, in the village, the trade unions in the city, and we started a campaign. Very soon, environmentalists, actors, writers, journalists, jurists, scientists, academics, everyone got involved in this. 
And in one day of collective action, while the people of Apavala came down and walked on the streets of their village, we walked out of our jobs in the afternoon and picketed in the Fort Railway Station. The most eclectic crowd of people I've ever seen in a picket line. And with the groundswell of public opinion, the Supreme Court decided this is a violation of the fundamental rights of the people of this country. And the project was stopped. Now, what we saved was not just the phosphate deposit. Apavala sits in the middle of an extraordinary, man-made, ancient, uh, elaborate soil and water conservation system that fed water to the tanks from ancient times to today in Anuradhapura and irrigated thousands of acres of land in this country. The Nobel physicist, a Nobel laureate physicist, Philip Anderson of Princeton, no less, said, Epavala is one of the most, one of the most scientifically important and unreported stories in this world. How did we stop this? Just by the collective consciousness of a cross-section of the people of this country who decided we must do something to protect a part of our heritage, our culture, our people and our land. And that brings me to the question, is it all right for us to be indifferent to the, pain, to the massive problems this country faces today? You have heard the bluster of the politicians, grand vision of 2025, wonder of Asia. Now you are laughing, <laughs> but you were not laughing then. But look at what this country is going to face, debt. When our current creditors come calling in two years from now, 2019, our debt will be $3.9 billion. Our reserves today are $4 billion. By 2019, we need $7 billion to pay our debt and to bridge the, the budget deficit, the, the financial deficit. Now, you don't need to be the head of IMF to figure out we are not going to make it. 4.5, we are not going to have the growth because we are facing the worst drought this country has seen in 40 years. Corruption, we have slipped from whatever we were to the 95th position in the Transparent International Corruption Index. And the country we like to aspire to be, Singapore, is number eight. Water, massive crisis. Only 40% of the people in this country have drinking water. And the rest of them depend on wells, rivers, they're running dry. And, the, and, and recently you saw the Umaya project take sucking in water from the underground and releasing at 200,000 liters or something per second. And they're sending water by Bowser's to these people. But two important things I want to talk about before my time runs out. Health and education. Health is a frightening situation we face. You have heard about the kidney disease problem that has been ravaging this country for the last 30 years. Still, they don't know the cause because most of it happens in the Andhradapura among the poor farmers. We need a thousand dialysis machines, we have 180. There's no chance in health that we're going to deal, address this problem meaningfully. Now, compound this with diabetes. One out of five Sri Lankans have diabetes. One out of nine Singaporeans have diabetes. And the Prime Minister of Singapore has declared war. Three things he spoke about as important things for him uh, in, his, in his National Day speech. Preschool education, smart nation, diabetes. Now, diabetes contributes to kidney failure. Now, you see the problem compounding. By 2030, 30% of this country will be the aging population, over 65. Look at their health problems. These three deadly developments are going to come biting and cripple our health system completely. You saw what happened when the dengue outbreak. Three people to a bed in a hospital. And the doctors and nurses are at breaking point. Education. Isn't it terrible what we put our children through? And I talk about this ridiculous uh, um, scholarship exam. Grade 5. They take these children who are 10 years old, 11 years old, and put them through a nationally competitive examination to get the race to the top so that they can get to better funded schools for their secondary and, 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 and higher education. And what do we do? We send them for classes when they are one, grade 1, 5 years old. Everyday tuition classes. 
what are we doing? We are taking the joy out of our children's childhood. And in the process, we are killing the human spirit. And this brings me to the talk that Ken Robinson gave, a famous TED talk, you must listen to this. Do schools kill creativity? And he made the very compelling case that as we face an uncertain future, what we would need is creativity and the teaching of the arts in the schools. And I completely subscribe to his view. In fact, that's one of the few talks that has inspired me so much that I talk about it at every given opportunity like I'm doing today. Uh, but I'm now asking myself, is creativity alone enough? Creativity for what? Shouldn't creativity serve the greater purpose of humanity? Take the example of Google, Amazon, Facebook and Apple. My God, these are great innovative companies, aren't they? And they absorb the best creative talent in the world. And what are they doing for the betterment of humanity? Very little. In fact, all these companies hoard billions of dollars of money that should be paid in fair share of taxes. Money that can go for critically, absolutely urgently needed public spending. And they contribute to the greatest income inequality in the world. And you want to send the best and brightest to work for them? Where is their consciousness? And what do they do? Look at the income inequality. I mean, today, uh, six people in the world, all males, four of them from Silicon Valley, own as much wealth as 50% of the world's population, 3.6 billion. Is that all right? And so I come to my conclusion. Lenin, Bala Thampo said, told, give me 10 professional revolutionaries and I will overturn Russia. And he was referring to the most oppressive czarist regime that the world had seen. Millions of people in poverty and starvation and all that. But I'm looking at this room today. If everyone who bought a ticket came, there are what, 1,100 people. And some of you are extremely talented. You have access to technology that I could never have dreamed of when I was your age. And you have some wealth as well. Now, suppose you had used a little bit of your consciousness to address one of the large issues that face us. That would have been very meaningful. And that's why I say, an ounce of consciousness is worth a ton of creativity. And suppose you had 30 seconds to reflect on your life. What will you think of? Okay, I had a wonderful career, I had a great job, and uh, one good. I, you know, provided for my family, they all looked after, great. I had a great carefree life, fun-filled life, wonderful. But what if you have used the talent that you have, the knowledge, the resources, and your creativity to have raised consciousness about one of the many inequities that face this country today, and inspired to be a part of a movement? Look at the possibilities. Only then can you truly say, my life was well lived, and my life was worth it. Thank you.